guys, welcome to episode 66 of my Warhammer 40k uh, review series. This week I will be reviewing issue 66, as you can see. Uh, this week we're getting a, an, a Plague Marine Icon Bear. Let's open that one up and let's get everything out of there. They picked a nice salmon pink for the front cover. It's weird. It kind of looks like they picked red and it's faded because of the colours they use. But when you look at the rest of it, you realise that's actually intentional. Oh, well. um, got a base. Can't forget the bases. Most important thing. Don't always get bases, strange enough. I've had a few without. Okay. A fantastic model. Uh, very nice, very detailed. Um... As as all the models have been, it's basically uh, the equivalent of an ancient or a banner bearer. Um, got some great details. Got got your lopsided fly wings. He's got a bolter, um, which is fairly standard but looks good. Yeah, a, a sword on the back, so I imagine that's in his equipment and well uh, as well. And one of my one of my favourite details for. A lot of the uh, a lot of the Nurgle Marines, he's got that little pickle helm um, thing. In case you're wondering what a pickle helm is, it's a kind of, of um, helmet that was worn by the Germans in World War One. It's got a spike on the top. I'm not sure why it has a spike on the top, but um, <coughs> they carried the aesthetic on um, for a lot of uh, Marines, and then it's kind of become a Nurgle thing. Um, so they carried the aesthetic on for a lot of Space Marines, particularly in the early days, and it's kind of come become a specifically Nurgle thing because it. It kind of uh, <clears throat> mirrors the single horns on the um, on the plague bearers, <clears throat> so that's um, that's pretty cool. As I say, as always, fantastic detail. <clears throat> um, as with a lot of them, we're looking at the older styles of armor, so that's um, <clears throat> that's pretty cool. Does bear a bit of a resemblance to the Maximus armor. <clears throat> Um, but then again, it is also slightly different, so I don't know whether that's a, a personalised armour or what that is. <laughs> but it looks uh, it looks pretty fantastic. Um, that'll be up for, for grabs at the end of the episode, so check that out. Um, let's dive right in. <clears throat> Let's say nice image showing you what the guy's supposed to look like and how he's supposed to function. So that's pretty <clears throat> that's pretty cool right there. Well, not how he's supposed to what he's supposed to look like and what he's supposed to look like painted rather. As I say, they've gone for this kind of this kind of weird peach colour <coughs> with the um, with the cover. I think that's just because they're trying to make each each cover look individual. Um, unfortunately, it kind of looks like they'd intended it to be red and is faded in the sun, particularly where obviously they've gone for a very uh, similar sort of um, <coughs> colouring in the background. But it is intentional. Um, you can kind of see by the fact that this is all brightly coloured and as it should be. Um, they do that a lot. They kind of match the colours up with the colours uh, on the front of the thing. Um, I guess that just makes it more... Wow, that's not in the picture. Sorry, it makes it uh, easier to spot on the shelves. As always, front cover, signature by Ian. <coughs> Our spiritual leech. <coughs> he's actually just... Um, he's a Hatchet Works employee, I think. Uh, I don't think he's a... Don't think he's a a GW employee. He's just like the um, editor. Uh, where are we? Oh no, no, yeah. Part works managing editor uh, Ian Huxley. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know if that's uh, yeah, that's the Hatchet works bit. That's the GW work bit. So I think Ian is just the guy that manages their part works on behalf. Yeah, you know, on behalf of GW. So he is a GW employee. Bless his little soul. And here, here is what made me look, say that's an amazing picture. That's a Black Templar. And possibly the most mental looking Marine I've ever seen. And there have been some mental looking Marines. That guy is bat crap crazy. Look at him. <sighs> With his happy little sword. No, 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 no mistakes. Just happy little psychos. Um, <clears throat> first step... Uh, First page is obviously about the Black Templar Space Marines, who are uh, another one of the cooler and more well-known um, non-founding chapters. The Black Templars are a successor uh, to the Imperial Fists. Um, 
basically when uh, Gilliman said, look, we've got to break these things up to make sure no one has that much power ever again, um, the Imperial Fists... Uh, <clears throat> my brain just farted and I forgot the name of the fucking Imperial Fists Primarch. Rogaldorn, thank you. Weird. Um, Rogaldorn agreed. And he broke his guys up into several things. The uh, the Imperial Fist he kept, and their job was primarily defence, particularly shoring up the defence of Terra after the Heresy. Uh, the guys that he'd sent to basically find and kill any remnants of the Heresy uh, became the Black Templars, and they're basically on a permanent crusade, constantly hunting down Chaos uh, or Xenos or anything and just killing it wherever they find it. Um, the Crimson Fists... I'm not entirely sure what they were originally created for. Currently, they're orc killers because of their background. And uh, the soul drinkers uh, fell to being um, renegades. They don't worship chaos, but they are warped by chaos. Um, interesting book by uh, GW author Ben Counter. Uh, there is a, well, interesting, but there's an omnibus. Interesting three books. Um... <clears throat> Not his best work, but still quite good. Uh, totally worth a read. Um, in case you're wondering what I'm comparing that to, uh, the Grey Knight trilogy is, in my opinion, one of the best books GW's ever done. It's very meaty, very broad, and really explores some of the sort of weird possibilities you can have with different forms of chaos. Um, and I think Ben Gander did a really good job that job with that. And I'm not just saying that because he used to come to my shop. Name drop. Um, anyway, Black Templars are a successor chapter of the Imperial Fist, valiant warrior knights who have carved their names into legend throughout thousands of years of war, honour and sacrifice. They have embraced the worship of the Emperor as a god, which is actually unusual for Space Marines. If they bring back Rogaldorn, it will be interesting to see how how that plays, because Rogaldorn, like, <coughs> like Gilliman, did not believe in the Emperor as a god and embraced what was known as the Imperial Creed, which was a secular... Um, creed believing in the worship well believing in not in the worship of anything but in science and things like that in case you're wondering what the whining is this is Roxy and she wants scratches on her back don't you Roxy you want screen Um just in case you wonder what that noise is <clears throat> the Black Templars are another non-codex compliant chapter um, the way they the way they do things is Roxy, is uh, slightly different. For example, they have um, scouts, but they don't put their new guys in scouts. They put their new guys in normal units um, along with full marines, and they those full marines teach them what they need to know. Um, I believe they're in scout armor. I think you've basically got guys in scout armor and full marines working together in the same unit. Um, I'm not entirely sure. I haven't fully read their uh, uh, their current codex. <clears throat> they uh, they got really popular in Third Ed, where they got their own codex, uh, which was a piece of filth. It really was. It was an uh, it was a really good codex, but it worked way too well, particularly with the way assault worked in Third Ed. I went up against Templars with a corn army and got tabled in close combat in two turns. And when I say two turns, I move my guy, I mean, no, yeah, my turn, his turn. Um, and then that was it. It was pretty much over. There were a few guys left on the table and he was easily able to mop those up in the second turn. I advanced forward. He came, you know, I advanced forward to the point where I wasn't in contact with any of them. But I made it some ground, ready to do something next turn. My mate, Phil, who played it, came forward, killed 90% of my guys. And that was it. He was like, what the fuck? Um... Part of that was that the Codex was meaty and designed for assault specifically. Part of that was that Third Ed assault rules allowed you to just roll, do rolling assaults. So you could just wipe across, march across the board, wiping things out. Which was why Fourth Ed came out pretty quickly and nerfed the crap out of that. But um, yeah, they came out as a an assault specific chapter. And a lot of their background reflects that. Um... Enough, Roxy. <clears throat> in that they are very much, you know, they're religious fanatics. Uh, you know, as you can see in the name Templar, they follow a lot of the very sort of monastic uh, European um, ideas. Um, <clears throat> and so, 
sword philosophies um, very similar to the Knights Templar, although the Black Maltese Cross is actually from historically from something called the Knights of St. John, who were actually defensive knights. They used to go around building hospitals to help people. Um, if you're wondering whatever happened to them, if you ever see something called St. John's Ambulance, which is a volunteer um, ambulance slash first aid slash <clears throat> hospital, uh, hospital organization, literally descended from the Knights of St. John. They just don't wear armor anymore and are a bit more pleasant. Um, no stabbing and shipping people. But, um, it, you know, the Black Templars were a little more based on a lot of the stories that came around from the Knights Templar, who were a fanatical religious organisation who used to go around doing something called Killing for Christ. And if that sounds like a contradiction to you, it is to everybody else as well. Loads of weird history involving a man called Pope Innocent. Um... <clears throat> and the Crusades, um, which are a particularly bloody part of history. And the Black Templars draw a lot from that in their background. Um, they are fanatical, they are brutal, and you can you can tell they're fanatical. Look at that face. Um, they worship the Emperor as a god, and they're also one of the largest single Space Marine chapters because they have a lot of different crusading forces, and uh, they're splitting up and founding new ones, and then bringing numbers in, um, no one's quite sure how many they've got, but it is suspected they're probably about the size of a legion at this point. Um, <clears throat> that being said, because of their fanaticism, <clears throat> uh, they're unable to draw their forces together because they're scattered across the galaxy uh, fighting crusades and they never go home because they don't plan. Yeah, that's not how they work. You know, the only time... Uh, Black Templar force would return back to the main Black Templar fleet where the chapter master is would be if they absolutely annihilated everything in their crusade and were 100% successful or if they'd been absolutely annihilated and it was 10 guys limping back <clears throat> but um, yeah they're, they're quite huge um, it goes through a lot of details about them um, gives you again uh, another, another sort of thing which lends to the fanatical thing is their bow cry is no pity, no remorse, no fear. Um, they are fleet based. Their um, chapter master is a man called High Marshal Helbricht. Uh, special trees, zealotry, melee combat and overwhelming assault, which they are really good at. <clears throat> There's a lot of good information here on the Black Templars. Gives you a lot of good stuff in the background. <clears throat> They've not... <clears throat> You've got uh, some colours there, um, some of the um, bits from the basic um, separate chapter, not the basic separate chapters, um, some of the bits from the um, separate crusades they run, and then some of the um, heraldry for their, uh, for their sergeants and the like. Uh, it doesn't have any successor chapters to the Black Templars, there may well be some, but primarily they don't tend to bother creating successor chapters. They just split off and create new crusades. Um, I'm think I'm sure there's a couple of uh, Black Templar successor chapters, but I couldn't name them off the top of my head. I can't imagine that, given the size of them, that people haven't stepped you know, in, the Imperium hasn't stepped in on occasion. Gone right, those guys are a separate chapter now. You know, there's too many of you. Um, Although they still kind of pay spiritual fealty, if you will, to the Imperial Fists and to Rogal Dawn. And if he ever comes back, I assume that they'll be pulled in the way that the ultimate successors have been pulled in with uh, Gilliman. Uh, you know, a lot of people sort of say that. I, I'm not alone in saying if that Primark comes back or if that Primark comes back. Um, most of the Primarchs are supposed to be able to return in some way, shape or form. <clears throat> the suspicion on Rogel Dawn, which I think I've mentioned before, is um, his relics are broken down into three things. There's his skeleton held by the uh, Templars. Uh, there's his blood held by the Imperial Fists. And supposedly there was a soul spear held by the soul drinkers. I don't know what the Black Templars are supposed to hold. But one of the uh, fan theories is that if you get all of these things together in the same place, 
there's there'll be some magical ritual to rebuild him and then the soul spear you know the body you know the bones and the body going together and the soul spear downloading his soul back into the body so that he's it's the same guy born again or something like that whether or not that ever happens not a clue that would be down to GW. If you're an Imperial Fist fan, uh, Imperial Fists fan, pester them. Because they love that. Uh, I've got a little brief history of something called the Rillia Crusade. Um, it goes on here about the Templar chapter is organized into fac uh, formations known as Crusade. Each of these can each of these forces can number hundreds of space marines and is led by the equivalent of a captain. You know, sorry, they're equivalent of a captain, a marshal. Below is an example of one such crusade. Um, so here's one crusade, and <clears throat> you can see it has four companies there. Um, um, one, two, three. So you've got initiates, neophytes, bikes, scout bikes, attack bikes, land speeders. Um, yeah, it's got a big, big list of them, and Given all the things there, you could easily imagine that there's over 400, maybe 500 uh, guys in that crusade. Um, possibly less, possibly 300, depending on how much they've done. And being as the Black Templars are supposed to have multiple crusades going on at any given time. And certainly, you know, if that were one, if that were one crusade and it were a thousand man chapter, they'd have two crusades going on at any given time. They don't. They have dozens. So it gives you an idea how many uh, Black Templars they actually are. Um, it also goes on to Abor the Witch. One of the great mysteries surrounding the Black Templars is their lack of librarians. Some say the Black Templars obey the Emperor's ancient, ancient edict of Nikea, which outlawed the Space Marine Legion's librarian divisions. As I say, the Black Templar librarians were slain in a great war, though they have no librarians of Black Templars, still have a great respect for na navigators and revere Astropas, believing these suckers have actually communed with the Emperor. Um, <clears throat> again, that, that's a nice cool bit of detail. It means if you're playing Black Templars, you can't use uh, psychers, but... Um, they still use psychers in their background, um, and if you read that, if you um, if you are any kind of aware of certain parts of Christian history, there are certain things which are deemed bad, but if they're connected with God or blessed by Christ or that, they're magically converted to good. Well, magic they're religiously converted to good because they're purified, you know, by the presence of God or something like, or something of that ilk. When I say something like I'm not dismissing, I'm just I don't under I don't know the specifics of it. There's a lot of things where they go, well, hang on, but this is bad and evil, and they go, well, no, actually, it's okay. It's purified by the presence of God or by the fact that you're doing it for God. Um, one of the uh, one of the um, I don't want to say excuses, <clears throat> but one of the um, ways in which murdering thousands of people was forgiven in the Crusades was the fact that. Um, the Pope at the time said it was being done in the name of Christ and that transmuted it from being murder to being a, a holy act, um, thus taking one of God's primary commandments, thou shalt not kill, and and flipping it on its head. Um, politically, supposedly, he did that because the European knights were so busy killing each other that, that he needed to send them off to kill somebody else instead. But let's not go into the details there. There's a lot of cool stuff about the Crusade, and a lot of it is. There's a lot of really good stuff and a lot of really bad stuff. It was a really weird time, particularly if you look at the Christian knights' respect for the other god, for the leader, for the Muslim knights and the other knights. It kind of there was nastiness and there were bad guys, but when you look at some of the respect that the sides had for each other, it kind of makes you think, you know, if they could do that whilst murdering each other by the hundreds probably thousands <clears throat> yeah it puts bigotry in this day and age where we're mostly at pe uh, peace kind of in perspective um <clears throat> i want to say that respect uh, the leader of the muslim armies uh, was a guy called Sahaladin, and when he died they built him a simple wooden um <clears throat> sarcophagus because that was the way of his belief and then the christian knights went well, that's not good enough. And they built him a massive gold one and they crossed it in jewels because they had that much respect for him. 
the, the Christian knights considered the Muslim leader, who was a Muslim, called Sahaladin, to be the perfect example of a knight. Yeah, like I say, little detail, kind of puts, uh, kind of puts some of the bigotry you get spewed around the internet today in perspective, when actual Templars who actually kill people could have respect and uh, got armchair and keyboard warriors that don't. But that's just, you know, that's just that. Um, next, it goes on to the renegade forces of Nurgle. Um, the Death Guard are not the only heretic Astrates warriors who worship Nurgle. Many other war bands of renegade Chaos Space Marines have pledged their allegiance to his cause. Um, Chaos Space Marines... Uh, a Chaos Space Marine of the Purge unleashes fury upon hated Ultramarines. So that's that's a Nurgle Chaos Space Marine, but he's not uh, he's not Death Guard. He's independent. Um, it goes on again to over the millennium, many Space Marines return from the light of the Emperor in order to pursue their own desires. Most of these renegades eventually turn to the worship of the Dark Gods. Um, I think that's primarily because if you're a Space Marine, there's two shows in town. There's the um, there's the Imperium and there's Chaos. So, um, <clears throat> you know, if, you, if you're not of the Imperium um, <clears throat> and you're getting hunted down, the only real sort of safe harbour is to, is to worship Chaos. And if you don't, you end up, you know, you, you haven't got big numbers to protect. You can end up getting hunted by both sides. Um, when a group of space marines turn to the worship of Nurgle, they often display icons and symbols that uh, show their devotion. Some will also experience mutations, for example, their innards may fuse with their armour, or foul liquid may seep from their armour plates. Some warbands who accepted Nurgle's gifts have established a fearsome reputation across the galaxy, spreading foul disease and scouring life from the surface of hundreds of worlds. Um, he also goes on to say that since the opening of the Great Rift, there are many more of these roving warbands. Um... It's that yeah, it, it gives a lot of stuff there. Um, but it also points out they are not true plague marines. Nurgle reserves the ability to create plague marines for a few trusted servants, such as the Death Guards and the Black Legion. So that's interesting. The Black Legion have plague marines. Nurgle keeps a close eye on all his followers, however, and those renegades who serve him well with their acts of slaughter and destruction may eventually attract his attention enough to be granted demonhood. So it's worth noting these are Nurgle Marines, but not Death Guard, which means you can use, you know, if you want to use some of the Death Guard models, I don't think they have any problem with that. If you want to use some of the basic Chaos Marine models and convert them over, I don't think there'll be any problem with that either. Um, interesting point that, as I say, that um, the Black Legion has Death Guard, um, uh, you know, proper, has Plague Marines rather, um, rather than just Nurgle worshipping Marines. Um, because they're kind of the core generic chaos faction uh, for 40k. Um, it's got some um, some images there. As you can see, these are much more generic chaos marines with a Nurgle touch than they are specific Nurgle marines. But um, they still look cool and they still look interesting. Um, you've got four different chapters they're giving out here. The Cleaved, The Purge, Deathmongers and The Grey Death. After the Death Guard crippled their fleet, the Iron Drake chapter became marooned on the plague world of Anathrax in the Eye of Terror for over a century. Um, plague Marines harried the stranded loyalists away, aiming to, aiming to wound their targets, damage their war gear rather than slay them. Since returning to the Imperium, they fought under the name of the Grey Death, and their new loyalties are plain to all. <coughs> so it looks like they've had to turn to chaos just to survive, which is interesting. And that, that does point out, that does bring, raise an issue factor that even, um, which is those guys there, even under the banner of chaos, there are going to be marine chapters, yeah, even under the banner of chaos, and within the worship of one god, there are going to be marine chapters that probably hate each other. I doubt the Great Death will like the, uh, the Death Guard. Let's have a look. The Purge. The Purge loathe life in all its forms. They have waged... Uh, their pitiless war against mankind and alien life since late M36. Can, if anybody's wondering what M, the M36 and M21 and M41 stand for, they're not motorways, it just means millennia um, 36. 
Uh, Roman numerals M means a thousand, so that's the year 36,000, which means they've been around for, what, on the 42nd now? Which means they've been around for at least 6,000 plus years. I'm not sure what year, we're, what M we're on at the moment. Um, consumed by their self-imposed quest to exterminate all living creatures, having seen firsthand the dread threat of chaos, they believe that the galaxy is hopelessly corrupt. And the only salvation lies in the sterility of death. To pur they, the purged prey to Nurgle got a plague for a pandemic that will destroy every living thing. I don't think he's going to give them that. Um, but I, yeah, you can kind of see how... I mean, that's actually a really interesting because you can kind of see how chaos warps even good intentions. They're trying to save the galaxy by wiping out all life because if you wipe out all life, you wipe out chaos. You know, no living creatures, no souls, no chaos. Um, basically, they're 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 a, they're a chaos plague god thing that is trying to commit suicide. If they're successful, they'll kill their own god, which again is a is a pretty cool thing. And as I say, you could probably use Death Guard to represent these guys if you wanted to uh, the Plague Marine models. Um, but at the same time, um, you could use standard uh, standard marines and modify them. Uh, I believe there are different rules for marines bearing the mark of Chaos Gods as opposed to the specific marines. Uh, from what I understand, you basically take a basic marine thing, they get a mark of a god, and it gives them a bonus, like a plus one toughness, plus one... For, it was plus one... I'm not actually sure of the current one, because I haven't read the, co the current codex that well, because I've been too skint to buy all the codexes. But the old codex is... The way it worked was plus one strength for corn, plus one attack for Slanesh, um, plus one initiative for Zinch, I think, and plus one toughness for Nurgle. And almost everyone agreed that plus one toughness was probably the best one. Um, so that was cool. The Annals of the Space Wolves. I almost read that as the Annals of the Space Wolves. It's not, it's the Annals of the Space Wolves. Um, we've got... This is another... Um, one of the uh, timeline ones um, running from A to running from A to Z from the beginning to current times um, uh, goes on starts off with the Wolf and the Lion Space and Dark Angels meet for the first time uh, Lehman Rust and the Dark Angel Prophet Lionel Johnson engage in a mighty duel um, the first in a list of long bitter feuds between the two warlords although from what we understand they eventually became friends <coughs> Second founding, the Space Marine leaders have broken down their chapters in accordance with the Codex Astratis. Largely ignoring the treaties, Rush retains much of his legion's strength, dividing only once to create the ill-fated Wolf Brothers chapter. A um, <clears throat> bit more detail on that one. Up until the creation of Primaris Marines, the Space Wolves could not split their chapter. Uh, they tried once to create a successor chapter. It was overcome by mutation. The theory is that um, you have to spend time on Fenris if you're a Space Wolf. Um, and that there's been something that was either put there when the Fenrisians first colonised it, a genetic editing, or was put there by the Emperor when he first landed to convert the Space Wolves into being very specifically only able to survive on Fenris, but give them some kind of advantage that we don't know about. And again, some of the theories are that the Space Wolves are more immune than other chapters to Chaos, oh, sorry, to Chaos's warping effect. Um, the theory being that a Chaos Space Wolf is a Wolfen. So yeah, when they mutate, they mutate down a fixed path and that path enables them to maintain their loyalty to the Imperium, although mutating them into these huge giant Wolfen creatures. Um, that's been lent some Credence when Magnus attacked the Fang. Um, the Space Wolves were on the cusp of fixing their ability to create other Space Wolf chapters by removing something from the Space Wolf genome or by editing it. And Magnus came in just to destroy that. Now, some people theorize he just didn't want other Space Wolf chapters because he hates the Space Wolves or because they're big, the biggest threat to him. Other people theorize, not Russ, um, Magnus the Red. Other people theorize that. Magnus the Red has a plan for the Space Wolves in the end times and it involves them maintaining and keeping that incorruptibility. Um, some people theorise that it, he's going to use the Space Wolves um, 
when he when he kills Zench. Um, and that's yet yeah, another fan theory that Magnus the Red is going to be the one that kills Zench, and then he's going to ascend to be the new god of change um, because Zench will have done everything by that point except die. And so to avoid stagnation, Zench will die and another being will ascend to Zench's place in the Pantheon. That's one theory. Um, yeah. <clears throat> but uh, who knows? <sighs> I love these theories. They're so weird. Um, <clears throat> if you're interested in these, they're out everywhere. You know, they're, they're, there's loads of GW uh, boards, or Facebook groups. Um, read them. You don't have to post them. There's a lot of interesting stuff out there. I think some of the best contributors to the fluff are random spots like myself. Um, although not me, because I don't tend to contribute that much. Um, the Primate Departs. It, during the 197th Feast of the Emperor's Ascension on Fenris, uh, Lehman Russ gathers his close retainers and departs to the Eye of Terror without explanation. Yeah, that's literally it. The, uh, the Space Wolves lost their Primate because he headed out the, to the shop for some cigarettes and never came back. And it's given them all some significant Wolf Daddy issues. Uh, particularly Bjorn the Fell-Handed, who is really, really, really pissed um, that he got left behind. Um, and, but he also got made the first chapter master. Um, so I'm there. Um, there's loads of random things. Um, <clears throat> not random things. There's loads more events than that. I'm not going to go through all of them because that would take forever. As always, it's a two-page job. And it's leading up to uh, the current day. Bad blood spilled. <clears throat> uh, Space Wars and Dark Angels fight alongside each other to quell an uprising on, on the Artemis system. In the wake of the conflict, Ranulph the Strong inadvertently kills a Dark Angel champion, Balthazar Zapin, in the traditional contest that reenacts a duel by Russ and L. Johnson. Uh, blood is shed on both sides in the ensuing... Uh, fracar, fracals. Um, <clears throat> that's another random thing. Every time the Space Wolves and Blood Angels meet, they elect two champions, and those champions fight not to the death, usually, but just to the beating the crap out of each other as a way of A, celebrating their history, and B, getting it out of their system. Uh, sometimes the Space Wolves win, sometimes the Dark Angels win. But it's their way of basically getting the aggression out of their system, either before they fight or after they fight, and remembering that, yes, they fought, but they are actually friends. In this one, the Space Wolf accidentally killed the Dark Angel guy, which was almost certainly not his intent, and it's caused some kind of fight, which is interesting. <clears throat> Next, we're going on to Forces of the Eldari. Uh, these are the Craftworld Elder. Or if you're an older um, GW player, Elder, uh, when we first did it, these were the several other factions, including Virgin, uh, including, yeah, Virgin World Elder, um, who may or may not be brought into, into um, reality a bit more, um, Dark Elder, and the Harlequins, although the Harlequins did exist in and amongst the Craft uh, World Elder. Um, basically, when the Elder's home world destro was destroyed, they fled in fleets of ships, a bit like Battlestar Galactica. Um, some of them were massive ships, some of them were small ships. Um, and even those that weren't part of massive ships have since then, who have since then built their ships together and made massive ships uh, and have these huge, basically floating colonies called craft worlds, which have fleets of ships around them. And they've existed that way since the fall of Slaanesh, which happened just before the founding of the em Empire. And was one of the things that, in fact, left so much space open to human colonization because the Elder had been a power up to that point. And he, um, mankind basically sprang out of Earth hot on the heels of their empire falling. So lots of things that they'd kept down or, or they'd kept out of the way were still kind of hadn't rebuilt. Um, and lots of things that they'd killed hadn't re-emerged or colonized they left a lot of stuff open and vulnerable um but nothing near their homeworld because that's where the eye of terror is um and it, that's what created the eye of terror the birth of slanesh created the biggest um the biggest uh area of chaos um real space overlap until the great rift happened <coughs> um 
which also indicates that somewhere along that line, some of the Necrons woke up because it was the Necron, it, you know, it was Necron obelisks that were holding the Eye of Terror in check. So that's all very interesting. <coughs> um, but anyway, uh, of the Eldari, fortunate enough to escape the fall uh, of their empire, the Starfarian craft worlders are the most numerous. Uh, they are graceful and deadly warriors who fight to preserve the legacy of their race. Um, they're very much built along the um, <coughs> the uh, concept of the long retreat, which is which originally comes from Lord of the Rings. Um, if you've ever watched the series, they go on about leaving to go somewhere else, um, and how their their numbers are dwindling, and they're basically going somewhere else to just you know live out forever, um, and they're not going to take part in the world anymore. Um, <coughs> that's kind of they that is referred to in some things I'm pretty sure as the long retreat where they're fighting and they're not giving up but they can't win because they're not they they decided not to be a big race anymore uh with the elders slightly different they haven't decided it was decided for them but it's the same thing of they are the most numerous of the elder but they are supposedly a dwindling race um with less elder being born and craft was getting destroyed um you know base uh, <coughs> And they're very much sort of harkening back to their old society in a very sort of melancholy way. They're very, it's, it's, it's really quite sad. But at the same time, they've got a lot of really awesome and cool stuff. Um, uh, there you go. What do you got? Um, location, galaxy-wide, number of craft worlds, unknown, estimated at hundreds. Um, specialities, speed and agility, advanced technology and psychic warfare. Their greatest flow, foes are Slanesh, the Dark Gods, and the Necrons. Um, Slanesh was born... Eldar experienced things much more intensely than humanity, and one of the reasons that Slanesh was born was because the Eldar had become incredibly hedonistic and were doing a load of stuff to experience stuff. Uh, it's one of the reasons why they're very, very hard to judge now, because they keep their emotions as in check as possible. Um, they're not logical like Vulcans, they are still uh, creatures of emotion, but they try and keep everything as perfectly balanced and um, relaxed and, yeah, like uh, not logical but cold as they can, just to try and avoid attracting the attention of Slanesh, feeding Slanesh, and getting eaten by Slanesh. Um, obviously, by extension, they're enemies of the other dark gods, and... Um, their enemy, their enemies are the Necrons simply because they were originally supposedly created by the Slan as a psychic weapon against the Necrons, and the Necrons are the only race out there who have the technology, the te yeah, yeah, have the technology, te not have the technology to be the Elder. Sorry, have the technological edge on the Elder. Their technology being older, they're pretty much the only race out there older than the Elder. So that's pretty cool. <coughs> it goes. It goes and explains a lot of this here. Um, it also explains that they've been forced to find a way to avoid Selenesha's hungry grasp. Eldari are prone to emotional extremes and feel sensation more keenly than humans. The craft way of Eldar have designed or developed a way of life designed, them, keep them designed to keep them focused and avoid temptation. Each Eldari adult, adult, I'll try that again. Each Eldari adult chooses a discipline to master known as the path, of which there are hundreds. Some are Dari may follow many paths during their lifetime. <coughs> Basically, uh, <coughs> um, <sighs> sorry, very twitchy. Yeah, and a Dari might spend a hundred years becoming the perfect potter, and then spend the next hundred years becoming the perfect cook, and then the next hundred years becoming the perfect warrior, and then the next hundred years, you know, so as to avoid straying too far down any one path. <coughs> Zimad becomes a perfect lover. Um, I don't know why I did a French accent there, but then there again, never mind. All Adari are psychic. Those that follow the path of Sia hone these talents and may even learn to predict the future. Some never leave this path, becoming far seers, the most powerful of the Eldari psychers. The path of the warrior produces aspect warriors. They make up most of the craft world's fighting force but all Eldaria trained to fight as a guardian defender militia, should the need arise. And even the souls of this still power. 
um, still serve, sorry, powering eerie ghost warrior constructs. So basically, uh, their professional full time army are the um, are the aspect warriors. Um, each one of those specialising in a different uh, faction of war, and you can move from one aspect to the other. But they have basically a territorial army that are trained to fight on weekends, I guess, which are the guardians. So that an entire craft world can go into battle if need be. It's also worth, worth noting that Eldar don't tend to make distinction between the genders when it comes to battle. Um, I don't know if that's down to sexism, down to a lack of sexism in their species, or down to a fact they can't afford to. But you know, it's cool. Um, it's got a list of different craft worlds here. You've got Beltane, craft world Orthway, uh, Eandon, Samhain, Alatok, um, Miria, Altansar, and Ibracil. Um, each of these crafts worlds are unique. Uh, some specialising. Um, for example, the craft world Eandon um, uses ghost warriors. Um, nearly destroyed by the Tyranids, the Eldara of Eandon will be forced to call upon the spirits of their ancestors. Uh, so that craft world uses a lot more spirit warriors and ghost warriors. Um, I think it's Sam Hine. Yeah. Sam Hine have what's known as, uh, well, the Wind Riders. Um, uh, they're the guys that uh, go to fight almost exclusively on Eldar jet bikes and Eldar grav tanks and that. So they're, they're the mechanized version, basically kind of the equivalent, the Eldar equivalent of the Dark Angels. And again, you can see that GW does a lot of, a lot of mirroring in its, um, particularly in its earlier creations. Uh, yeah, they start off with the Dark Angels getting an all bike section. Then they chose, then they gave a, the Orcs got the Speed Freaks, which is an all bike section, and the Eldar got the Wind Host, which is an all bike section, so that everybody kind of got everything. And you can you can spot it a lot more amongst the earlier stuff. It happens a lot less amongst the later stuff because the later stuff is a lot more individual. And by later periods, the older stuff has developed a lot more individuality rather than being um, based on very similar sort of concepts. <clears throat> which is cool. Um <clears throat> It doesn't say specifically here, but it's worth noting that when Eldar die, um, they get put into things called spirit stones. Uh, the reason they do that is uh, Slanesh and its demons love eating Eldar souls. They're addicted to them, basically. And they will hunt and consume any Eldar soul that dies and ends up in the warp. So instead of letting their souls go to the warp, they lock them in stones to keep them safe. Um, because those stones retain a certain level of sentience because the soul's in there, they then use those souls uh, to power a lot of their machines. Um, and from what I understand, they use them a bit like computers, you know, and things like that. Um, and the Farseers can even commune with those souls to ask them for advice. But that big war machine in there doesn't have an Eldar sitting in, uh, sitting in it, nor does the smaller one behind him. Both of those are powered by dead Eldar. Um... <clears throat> which also allows them um, to field uh, to field numbers more equal to their opponents, um, because galactically Eldar are almost, are almost always going to be outnumbered. Uh, and again, you can see um, <clears throat> that army there is yeah. You can see right at the back some actual Eldar. Everything else is dead guys, uh, dead guys powering armor, <clears throat> and they are quite a badass army you really need to think how you're going to deal with a ton of Eldar with de with with d cannons and stuff like that but yeah eandon's armies include towering wraith knights wraith lords wraith guard all powered by the captive souls of dead eldari warrior <clears throat> warriors that's not creepy at all <clears throat> here we've got some cool examples of different Eldar aspects uh these guys are basically um <clears throat> exarchs which are about which uh well, that's a farce here, but some of these guys are exarchs. Basically, uh, some people get trapped on the path of the aspect warrior and they never leave. Uh, some Eldar get trapped on paths, they become so obsessed with it, they never leave. But rather than kicking these Eldar out, they put them to good use by giving them the best armor and the best stuff. Because if you've been a warrior, if you've been a striking scorpion for 600 years, 
you're going to be damn good at it. If you've been um, a hawk warrior or a howling banshee for six or seven hundred years, you're going to be damn good. So they give them the best weapons and those guys lead the aspect warriors into battle and train the other aspect warriors. But it is generally considered, it is generally considered to be a shame and a bad thing amongst the elder. They're not ashamed of the guys, but it is to them, it's somebody losing themselves to the path rather than somebody becoming an expert in something. So that's good. Here we have, okay, next. Next up we have built how to build the icon bearer. Um, this does look a little faded actually. I wonder if it, I wonder if the magazine is a little faded. <clears throat> Very faded. But you've got the uh, the clip of safety, that's important. If you nick yourself, Nurgle may take hold in your soul. Um, he's a fairly simple guy to build. Uh, fairly straightforward. Um, um, on that one, um, and you've got some, you know, some nice paints there. So, so you've got a nice painting going on there. Um, as always, going from start to finish with some awesome stuff there. Sorry, guys, very twitchy tonight. Uh, checked out the cost. Uh, on the GW website, this guy is available solo for £17.50. So you are basically saving £9.51 um, on that. So that's not bad. That's that's a saving of more than 50%. So if you want that guy, uh, run out and get this copy of the magazine quickly because it's a lot cheaper. <clears throat> And if you want a couple of them, run out even more quickly. Um, we've got the next mission briefing, opening of the warp portal. Nice story here. Reality sundered, despite vicious fighting occurring around Martha early in the invasion of Corvan III, the city was able to evacuate most of its citizens before the war escalated. You know, so that's pretty cool. However, the, as the planet has become ever more corrupt by the slaughter and influence of Death Guard. The barrier between warp and reality is weakened in several areas. Maya Furt is one such location. The Death Guard, sensing which to bring forth demonic enforcements, have begun an operation to open a warp portal. <clears throat> so that's pretty cool. Now uh, this one's quite interesting. Um, you've got a set mat in the middle with set stuff, and then the outside stuff you're going to generate um, using the stuff using the uh, rules set forth in the previous magazines. Uh, you've got an army power rating of thirty. And some things you must include. Um, so basically, for the Death Guard, with a power rating of 30 and 3 command points, you must include a Malignant Plague caster and one unit of 7 Plague Marines with the Icon of Despair. Um, but the other, 30, um, the other 30 power rating points, if you will, uh, can be spent how you want. Uh, for the Space Marine commands, you must include one Primaris Librarian, but the other points can be spent how you want. Uh, deployment. The Death Guard deploy the Plague Marines and Malignant Plague Cast inside the Summoning Circle. The rest of the Death Guard move units onto the board at the start of their movement phase from the top and the bottom here. And the Summoning Circle just in the middle there. Uh, the Space Marine player deploys the units in their deployment zones on either side. The Space Marine player takes first turn. Yeah, so you basically you're using the mats in any way you want other than the middle and Again, you'll generate the uh, scenery there victory conditions for the death guard player to win the play marine with the open of despair must be be within the summoning circle at the end of the game um, If the play marine with the open of despair is eliminated or ends the game outside the summoning circle <sighs> The space marine player wins and the game lasts for five rounds so you've got to keep one guy alive in a sorry in a specific place in order to win. That does mean that if everybody else dies and he's got one wound left at the end in the summoning circle, you've won. But if the spaceman player manages to get him, get to him and kill him, you've lost. And that's that is going to be helped by the fact that he's a character, and as a character, he cannot be targeted if there are other units closer. So if you're intelligent, it's not that difficult. Um, but it does sound it, it sounds like it's going to be a challenge for both sides um, so it sounds like it's going to be a, an interesting game that one here we've got the um, Plague Marines stats 
but we do not have the icon bearer stats. Oh no no. The I'll tell you right, the icon bearer isn't a character. The icon bearer is a death guard <coughs> equipped with the icon. So here's a standard death guard, and it goes in a standard death death guard squad. <coughs> but that's okay as well, that allows you to give them the protection of a squad. Okay, we have the Plague Marine stats here, um, which are the basic champ uh, stats of a Plague Marine. Um, I'm pretty sure we got basic stats to begin with, but this is a full stat thing, so I think that's what the difference is here. Um, and well, so also it's the difference between um, Death Guard and actually, no, yeah, of course. <laughs> Those guys are Death Guard, these guys are Plague Marines, yeah, okay. Um, anyway, Plague Marine is movement 5, weapon skill 3 plus, bliss skill 3 plus, strength 4, toughness 5, wounds 1, uh, attack 1, and leadership 7. Plague Marine Champion has an additional attack and an additional leadership, and they both have a 3 plus save. This unit contains 1 Plague Champion and 2 to 4 Plague Marines and can include up to five additional Plague Marines. Um, change the power to 13 if you do. So you can have anywhere between three and 10 uh, Plague Marines um, with power rating seven if you have between three and five and power rating 13 if you have up to 10. I'm not sure why you wouldn't have up to 10. I'm not sure. You know, you can have one Plague Marine Champion and two Plague Marines. For seven points, or you can have one Plague Marine Champion and four Plague Marines, giving you five guys for seven points. I'm not sure why you'd only have three. Um, maybe uh, maybe there's an advantage later on there. Um, certainly, with the points system, you could get an advantage by reducing your points. But when playing with the power system, I uh, I don't know why you'd do that. Um, weapons, you, get, you can have a Blight Launcher, which is range 24, Assault 2. Uh, strength 6, AP minus 2, D3 damage. You can reroll wounds of 1 for that weapon. Uh, bolt pistol, uh, 12 inches range, pistol 1, uh, strength 4, AP 0, damage 1. Bolt gun, 20, range 24, rapid fire 1. Uh, strength 4, AP 0, damage 1. Uh, plasma gun, and all this is the same as the Imperial stuff, um, which is range 24, rapid fire 1 for both of them. And obviously strength 7, minus 3 AP and damage 1 standard, plus 1 strength and plus 1 damage if you take the supercharge thing, which has the standard supercharge rule to it. Uh, you get a plague knife, which you can re-roll rolls of 1, 4, which is strength, uh, melee weapon strength user, AP 0 and damage 1. Uh, plague sword, same deal, um, except with a plague sword you can roll... You can reroll failed wounds for that weapon, which is actually quite a powerful thing. I mean, I'd still rather have a power sword with better AP, but <clears throat> you get what you get. Um, power fist, which uh, with melee times two, uh, sorry, melee and strength times two, minus three AP and D3 weapons. When attacking with this weapon, you subtract one from the hit roll. Basically, it's a big, powerful, chunky thing. It used to be um, power fist attack last in initiative. Now that the initiative alternates between units, they've changed that, but personally I prefer, I like this way, it's nice. Um, blight Grenade, which, and um, Crack, sorry, Blight Grenade and Crack Grenade, both of which have a six inch range. Uh, blight Grenade has Grenade D6, so you can, you can basically um, get D6 shots. Strength three, low strength but not bad. Um, zero AP and damage one. You can reroll runes of one, for this weapon, so it's basically a, a frag grenade, but nice, a little bit nicer. And a crack grenade is a basic crack grenade. Grenade one, strength six, AP minus one, and D three damage. <clears throat> Ideal for taking out slightly tougher infantry. There, uh, war gear. Play champion may replace his bolt gun with a bolt pistol or plasma gun. Uh, play champion may take a power fist. Play champion may also replace his plague knife with a plague sword. <clears throat> so you can have either or. Um, and both, um, so you can you, you can have a power fist and a plague knife, or you can have a power fist and a plague sword, or you can pick one from the other. Um, and again, I'm sure there's points differences there if you go on the point system, but on the power system you can have what you like, so why wouldn't you take the better one? 
Uh, one play marine with a ball gun may also take an icon of despair. Um, so, yeah, this basically gives you all the play marine stuff. No, yeah, yeah play marine or death guard. Sorry, I'm getting confused. I'm thinking, what's going to be play marine? What we had um, the death guard with death guard specific. Death guard are play marines, um, but they're not chaos. They're not Nurgle marines or chaos renegades. I guess. Uh, let me just go back and double check that. I'm actually going to clarify that. And make sure I'm not speaking out my ass. Um, it happens a lot, you can usually tell. Uh, my mouth is moving, but the noise appears to be coming from somewhere else. Um, where are we? Where are we? Renegades of Nurgle. Um, do 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 do. No inspiration, do 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 do. Renegades, most of these are dark gods. Where, where were we? Nurgle's Giska and the Galaxy. Da, da, da. Despite the worship of Nurgle, Heretic Astralis, they're not true plague marines. Yeah, okay, so <clears throat> so the difference between these guys is, yeah, so these guys at the back are plague marines, but yeah, the same as Death Guard are, but the, uh, <clears throat> the, you know, the Nurgle Renegades would probably have a different set of stats, which they haven't given, but you know, if you want, I'm sure you can go out and buy the relevant codex. Um, any special rules for these guys? Uh, disgusting resilient. Each time this model takes a wound, roll five plus. Uh, on a five plus, the model, on a, um, the model does not lose that wound, which we've seen that a lot. Inexorable advance. Uh, models in this unit can fire twice with rapid fire weapons at range of 18. Um, they also do not suffer the penalty for advancing when firing assault weapons, so that's cool. Um, <coughs> Uh, death to the full semper for each hit roll of six this model makes in the fight phase it can immediately make an extra attack against the same unit using the same weapon <laughs> these attacks cannot earn extra attacks so that's pretty cool it doesn't mention anything about the uh, Imperium so it's it's different to the old veterans of the long war rule which only worked against um, other space marines or imperial forces and they also got the icon of despair subtract so units that are within six inches of an enemy unit with an icon of despair must subtract one from their leadership. So if you take the icon bearer, you're going to subtract one from the leadership, which means they're more likely to fail um, to fail their morale tests and take damage that way. So that's pretty cool. Oh, I've just dropped a page. Stop it. Sorry, it's falling apart. Um, but don't worry, they're meant to do that. Um, okay, so... Let's see what we've got. Issue 67, next week, we have got snipers. Um, they're a type of scout wielding a sniper rifle. Uh, they're quite nasty and very proficient at taking out specific targets, so we'll deal with the rules on those next week. Um, in the issue, it's covering scouts with sniper rifles, company and chapter champions, and discover the Death Watch. Which, um, and you'll like the Death Watch, they're cool. Then in issue 68, we've got some scenery again. Uh, this one being the Hematrope Reactor. Uh, we've had one of those already. This is another one. Uh, they come as a package of two. So basically they print out the basic one and given one away uh, with each um, magazine. I don't remember how much they cost. Uh, if you want to go and check my previous episode, that will tell you then. Or you can wait the next week or I'll probably repeat that statistic. Um, but I do believe you're still saving money on both those issues. Um, uh, Games of the First First Millennium, it's covering the Hematrope Reactor again. I'm sure we already had a Hematrope Reactor. Maybe I'm wrong, maybe we didn't. I'm just, no, I'm sure we did, we definitely did. Um, and then Eldari Harlequins, which are the coolest of the Eldari without without a doubt. So uh, check that out. And uh, Lieutenant Keltus of the Silver Templars, um, yet another uh, Space Marine chapter um, out there. So they're pretty cool, so check. Check those out. Um, nice as he checked that thing out. That's pretty cool. Right. Um, two things. <clears throat> two final things. Uh, both competition wise. Firstly, make a quote. Make a quote. Make a comment at the bottom of this, bottom of this video. Um, be to be in for a chance to win this uh, next week. I'll pick a quote at random. Uh, pick a quote. Pick a comment at random. That's how knackered I am. Sorry guys. It's been a knackering day. Um, <clears throat> uh, I'll pick a comment at random using dice. And that person will win this icon bet. Right. Um, I rolled for last week's competition. As I stated, I'm keeping 
the guy in the Tartarus Terminator armor because I like him. Um, and I'm giving away the guy in the Maximus armor because he doesn't fit in with my guys. So you will be getting, the winner will be getting uh, a, a sprue with holes in. Don't worry, that's, that's what the prize was. That's what the prize I put out was. And this guy's mine. <laughs> now for the fun part. Hooray for novelty names. Um, <clears throat> the winner of this one is a guy calling themselves R. Soul, first name Total. Um, <clears throat> you guys work it out. I'll PM you on the message, dude, um, with my email address, or if you want to send me uh, your address uh, straight away, my email address is wargameradaduk at gmail.com. So I'll PM you, uh, PM? PM you in the message. <laughs> Um, as well to get an address to send this to, and I will send this Maximus Armoured dude off to you uh, as soon as I get the opportunity. Um, bloody hell, I've been talking for an hour. My apologies, guys. I do blather on sometimes. Hope you guys enjoyed this. Hope you learned something new, um, and hope it was entertaining. And I'll see you guys next week where we'll be looking at Scouts with Sniper Rifles. Hi guys, hope you enjoyed that video. And if you did, remember to like and subscribe to my channel. I'm also on Facebook and Twitter. Not sure why, but I am. Um, so if you like it, see me there and uh, please tell your friends. Thanks very much. Bye.